Oh, sorry, you were taking a photo. It's okay. Carry on. Okay. Uh, and it's just that I mentioned it to me. Acorn was part of it with Manchester, yeah. wasn't it? Well, uh, this, this uh, I mean, we've got another one I've just since discovered. We've got a second one that's in much better condition. I'm hoping to get working. This one's a bit, a bit more problematic. Um, but when you bought that, you just bought bag bits. You had to put it together yourself. They didn't sell you a box, no power supply. And when, you, when it's finished, you had to then uh, press buttons in machine code, in hex, and your, your, your output comes on the lights at the top. So when the kids hear that, they think, that's, what sort of product's that? But they sold that for £80. And it was very successful. But what comes after that is, of course, um, I don't think Acorn were very good in the early days at the naming their computers. That was System 1, and surprisingly, 2, 3, 4, and 5 followed it, a bit bigger. Um, but it's still essentially you putting bits and pieces in. But eventually, we get to what you recognise as the BBCB, and the A and the B, and we talk about the Computer Literacy Project. But, but around about here, 85... The process is not fast enough. They want to get into a <coughs> user interface, a Windows environment. Um, they try various processes. They don't work. They send some guys over to the States to look at risk technology, reduced instruction set computing, and they come back and with very little resources. Herman Hauser often says that with great pride. Um, he gets two to the Acorn guys to work at producing the first of the ARM processors. So it goes into the A500. Um, but the ARM processor starts life as a prototype second processor for a BBC. And next door, we found one of these processors. We plugged it into a BBC, and on a BBC comes ARM development kit. So it's quite astonishing to see something so current on something so old. But that's and where it starts. One of the interesting <coughs> things that is easy to lose track of it. how much does a keyboard cost you? How much yeah. does a mouse cost you? Yeah. <coughs> and at the time, as we said earlier, you haven't got robots making these keyboards. They cost a fortune. Yeah. So Acorn's philosophy was the keyboard is something that's going to stay the same for several generations. Yes. What we want to be able to do is just keep changing the same processor. Yes. And so that's the, the philosophy. So the BBC is superb with all these input output devices. So the arm, the arm stays in all of Acorn's products that go into schools. Yeah. The arm just continued to be developed. The Archimedes and the RISC PC series all contain ARM processors. But what they come, they come to a point where they find that little tiny ARM processor doesn't use much power. And then another company is interested in that because low power means portability. So along come Apple with the Apple Newton, and of course it's ready for the ARM processor. So if you put a conventional processor in here, the battery would be flat in no time. Put an ARM processor in here, it becomes a portable device. Not quite put it in your pocket, but you can see where I, Apple were going. I was showing this to 15-year-olds yesterday, and of course I have to keep reminding myself as I wave it around as something relatively new, that it came out roughly when they were being born. But they, they that, of course, as one of them said, ah, the iPad. They, they see that what Apple were thinking about all that time ago, about writing on here. So Apple get involved, they put some money in, and in the end, um, ARM are making a fortune. ARM standing for Acorn Risk Machine. And in the end, Acorn decide they can't make computers anymore. They can't compete with the PC clones. This is Acorn's final effort, the Phoebe. Um, it's only one, there's only one or two in the whole world that's got the electronics inside. This is one of them. This never left the factory gate. They shut the company in terms of PC production long before that. And consequently, um, uh, ARM becomes advanced risk machines. It becomes a separate company, although it's actually employing a lot of the Acorn guys and it's just down the corridor in terms of offices. Um, and ARM now is a very, very profitable company based in Cambridge and it works on a sim simple principle. If you want to make a brand new mobile phone, you come to me, I give you a license to go and produce the, uh, use the ARM code, the ARM chip, the ARM core, and you give me a check. They don't manufacture the ARM. Um, at all. It's, it's all about licensing others to take the core and do what they will with it. There are more ARM processors in the world than there are people now. It's hugely successful, way outstripping Intel. But of course, if you're Intel, you put a label on the computer that says Intel inside. If you're a British ARM, you put the label on the inside of the computer, which never seems logical to me. But um, I, think, I think young people, certainly those studying post-16, should understand about the success of the of that as a, as a British technology and, and, and continued success. The ARM processors going into, I even saw one the other day in a gadget for checking diabetes. 
ARM processors are going into all sorts of devices because of their low power consumption. They're you know, an excellent embedded processor. Um, over here, we have two BBCs, BBC Masters, connected to um, interactive video. This, this has been in the news recently. So this is the Doomsday Project, and this is a technology um, most of the youngsters that were here yesterday were have a little chuckle to themselves that anything could be this big, but of course it is just a pre-CD, pre-DVD, same principle. Um, and the BBC wanted to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the Doomsday Project, so they decided to have a snapshot of life this time in the 1980s. To store video and images and text and data, they needed something with a lot of capacity, so the laser disc um, was an option at that stage. So, they uh, used two of these disks to make up the Doomsday Project. And the Doomsday Project, these disks run on Doomsday, uh, laser, laser players, Master 128 with a second processor, um, and a conventional monitor. And what's running on this, this machine is the first of the two disks, <coughs> it's called the Community Disk, and it's based upon uh, ordnance survey maps across the whole country. So, um, here we are looking at ordnance survey maps. Remember this is an 8-bit machine with no graphics card. Mm. And what we can do is map walk around the entire country. Zoom out. Change where we want to go. And at any point, zoom in. And when we get to the lowest level of zooming in, which is here, the block, as it's called, um, it's telling us the children in that area sent in up to three photos to represent their area. So this is repeated across the whole country, and they had to take those uh, their, the pictures they have taken in conventional cameras down to the chemist to get slides. Um, we didn't have digital cameras at the time. But what is difficult to re to see now, because we're also used to the web, is that this would have been in a school library surrounded by paper, and for the first time they're seeing images computer graphics mixed, multimedia has arrived. So that's the key message for the kids, that it won't always be on paper. One day, you'll have information looking like this. In the end, it wasn't going to be the laser disc, it's the web, but you could see where they were going. Here's the first picture. There's the second. And the third, the houses. And the children also put in up to 20 pages of text about their life often complete with spelling mistakes, sometimes credits, but essentially we get people here who 25 years ago have written this stuff and have never really had a chance to see it because the system was about 3,600 pounds to buy then, but not many schools had them. The technology um, is dying because dampness gets between the layers of the disc due to poor manufacturing and it suffers from something called laser rot and uh, as a result, the discs uh, eventually become useless. So I often talk to the students about the redundancy of, of these technologies and ask them a question about their own, you know, these 32 gigabyte little cards that they put in their camera that they've got tens of thousands maybe of images. Where's that going to be in 40, mm. 50? It's all terribly fragile. So mm. we talk about that um, and, and, and what we ought to do about some of this stuff and the problems that we face both then and now. Um, the other disc, the national disc, has got all the national statistics, tens of thousands of images from the 80s, um, an hour and 15 minutes of BBC video, so the Brighton Bomb, Falklands War, it's all on there, and those two together make up the Doomsday Project. So in its time, it was something really, really special. Now the BBC, over the last month, have taken the first disc I showed you, and it's all gone online. Go to Google, put in Doomsday Reloaded, and you can do what we were doing there. Wander the country and find the pictures. What they want your students to do is to go and retake the photos from that same position, upload it to the website, and then at the end of October, all of that's going into the National Archive. So it's an interesting project going on to encourage students to get involved with the project that uh, all that time ago. Well, I say all that. It doesn't seem like five minutes for me, but I was a teacher at the time contributing to some of this. Um, so, yes, uh, in its time, amazing, and it's situated in the school library. This was 
was, I think, incredible for encouraging young people to think of different ways information might be organised. Okay. Mm -hmm.